And really, I don't know that Peter needs a great deal of introduction. I would imagine pretty much anyone who belongs to this club or has anything to do with nature or anything around our area would know Peter. Um, I think the very first time I ever came across this, this lovely tall Scotsman was in the Outdoor Education Center when it was my first two children <laughs> that were going there. So that's many years ago. I won't tell you how old Amy is because it might show you how old I am. But Peter has been a naturalist for so many years, as you all know. If you're ever out and about, he's always so graceful and, and gives all his knowledge to you when you just meet him on the side of the road and he's going, oh, did you see that? Or did you hear that? He's so open and letting people in on what he knows. So without further ado, Peter, I can hardly wait to hear about India. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ben. <laughs> and I think we are ready to go. So good evening, folks. It is nice to be with you on what is a bit of a drippy night and to share one of the places I've been very fortunate to travel on several occasions eh, over a period of years. And it is a place which I left a number of years ago now, but I must say India has never left me. It is an amazing place. It's a mystic place. And so tonight, as we go forward, I'd like to present them peacocks, tigers and temples, three emblems of what India is and its natural history. There will be one or two birds <laughs> in this. Let's start off then. India is a bustling, busy, busy human uh, environment. Uh, we all are too aware of that right now as the pandemic pandemic just causes havoc in that nation. It is the world's second most populous and we'll get to those in a few minutes, but it is a rich, rich country in terms of, of its culture, in terms of its vibrancy and the human, the human activity that you see around. This particular image I, I like, a governing a India is a tough job and making sure that everybody has the services they need is also an exceedingly tough <laughs> business. However, they get to it, and here's how people tie in on their own, the electric grid. It is also a place where animals are revered from its Hindu tradition, and the cattle now that we think of as roaming wild, the holy cows as they were, in uh, India have now largely disappeared from the large cities, except when it comes to animals of, of, uh, of dray horses and animals of bark. The other character on the right, the macaque, is quite a character, and it, this is the rhesus monkey, the one for which the blood groups are listed, and they now are becoming a tremendous problem within Indian cities as vermin. They're big, they're tough, and as you can see, they have an attitude. The other side of India is this rural pastoral land. It is still a land of rich and very basic agriculture. Again, that has come to the fore in the last few months with the large uh, protests by Indian farmers against uh, the, the agribusiness that is now creeping in. It is something that doesn't just change the way of agriculture, it changes the way society operates. India is still very much a society of villages. It also has a rich, deep history. And part of that history is seen in monuments. And I'll start out with this one, which is in Delhi. It represented the end of the first Hindu empire that was in India. Hinduism had crept into India from the east through what we know as Burma and, uh, and Assam and had taken over the northern portion of India and it was ultimately in a great battle in 11, uh, 1187 that the Hindus were vanquished and the, uh, the Muslim uh, culture 
began its advance from Persia east. And here we see the first mosque that was ostensibly built in India. The tower itself is a 70 meter tower of a recognition like the Nelson Column in, in London Square, uh, Trafalgar Square, but it was built over a number of years and it is 70 meters high, but it is a great monument and now a world heritage site. It is then supplanted by the Mughal Empire. The Mughals were also a Muslim they came from Persia and they swept in and took off uh, down through the valleys that stretched from uh, Pakistan into the heart of India. And as they went, they established a great empire that lasted from a, well, it, it lasted from 1526 ultimately to 1857. So a very stable one, but it was also an incredibly a forgiving and welcoming a takeover. People were allowed to continue their own traditions without fear of persecution. This is one of the first great monuments that was built, the Shama Mishad, the great red a, a mosque in the heart of Delhi, very close to the Red Fort, and built about 1690. Sadly, one of the things that has changed there since I first went is birds in the air over the mosque. Initially, it was filled with vultures. Vultures were the birds that kept the cities clean, that uh, in many cases removed the dead and by devouring them, and suddenly they disappeared. We'll talk to that a little later, but you can see here we have the black kite that is a, over the town now. And I brought it in because this has replaced the vulture. And so now as you're in these great sites, these birds quite often come down and will pick food from you, but these are the transplanted replacements of vultures. <laughs> now we're not wanting to advance. There we are. Another of the great Mughal uh, uh, structures was this particular mausoleum, Humayun's tomb, built in 1571. And it was uh, built by the fourth Mughal, Mughal emperor, emperor, and it sits on the western gates of, of New Delhi. And it is massive. You can see the people on the walkway at the top. The main tomb is under the, the dome, and there are several smaller uh, mosque-like chapels for people to worship, and also to, uh, that hold the remains of others of the family. You can see here some of the aspects of Mughal ar architecture that came to be in the, in the uh, represented when we got to the, the greatest of all, the Taj Mahal. So you have a plinth that carries the main building. Then up here you see this rather, this was one of the first iterations of this particular form, a dome with a collar that held it up. So here we see the original concept that led ultimately to his great grandson's building, the Shah Jahan building of the Taj many years later. It is great to be in these places because not only do they have this wonderful culture and well-maintained a uh, cultural aspect to India, but it is a place where you can get to become acquainted with some of the common birds of India. These are the city birds. These are the birds that you will find almost everywhere. The miners are actually a group of starling-like birds. And uh, this one is the common miner that you see. Then we have on the right, the jungle babbler. Uh, these go around in mob crews. They travel in family groups of up to 15 or 16 birds, and you certainly hear them coming and see them going. And one of my favorites, and quite a, a, a unique and <laughs> bizarre bird, is the hoopoe, which feeds by drilling into the ground and uh, picking up worms and other small subterranean uh, insects. But it also feeds a lot on lizards, which it will pick up with this beak. 
Now, Delhi itself and the country, uh, Delhi is the large metropolis of the seat of government, and this is typical travel conditions, not at rush hour. That is normal traffic. In fact, when you go around a roundabout, you have to be careful because somebody may be coming in your lane the other way. They take whichever route is most uh, available. But down below, you see this completely different view, which is where we're going to spend most of our time. But this shows you how a, the breakup of India is in terms of population. The most populous coming down through the section close to the Himalayas, fed by the water there, also the coastal regions. Out here is the great Western Desert, Rajasthan, and then in the middle you get this incredibly fertile, beautiful highland area. And this is where we will be uh, spending most of our time tonight. But before we do, just ha let's have a look at a few of the details. It's quite a large country, but its population is absolutely astounding. This is today's total population. Two weeks ago, it was 108,000. So you can see the, the speed with which they're uh, increasing their population. Incredible density of population. It is a, only 1.4 of the planet's land base, however. And look at this, 17.74% of its population. However, in 1970, there were as few as five national parks. Now there are 51. Bird species, 3,000 species have been recorded within India. 64 of those are endemics, 352 mammals, and a project tiger reserves now number 48. These are the resources that most people would look to. Birds of India, and the mammals of India. And those are both exceedingly helpful uh, resources. So here we have India. Here we have its division into the central plain, uh, the central highlands that I mentioned. Here we see the great plains sweeping up and around the desert to this section and getting quite a uh, lush to this section. And this is where we will spend most of our time. We're going to visit basically four reserves. And these are the locations. So most of them in the central highland area. The first will be Rantambore. And here we are moving to our accommodations there. The accommodations were very comfortable throughout India. And it's amazing what happens when you step outside the walls. It is a very, a, almost shocking difference in the way in which we travel through India and in which many of the citizens themselves travel. These gardens, however, are filled with wonderful birds. And one of the first of the endemics in India was this little fellow, the, the purple sunbird. Actually, it's not a fellow, it's a, a little lady. This is the female purple sunbird, and it is feeding on a sleeping hibiscus, which is rather interesting. This beak does not reach into this closed flowers. What she does is pecks a hole in the bottom and reaches in to get the nectar. The male is quite a bit more colorful. Beautiful little bird. Uh, he has a nice little shoulder patch of yellow, which does not show in this photo. Also, it was where we became uh, quite familiar with the first of the bee, bee eaters, which we would see throughout our trip. And this one largely a migrant from Europe. We were there in late fall and winter, which is the same seasonal uh, sequence of the year that we have. India is in the north of the equator, so they were going through fall into winter while we were there. This little fellow is a particularly attractive one, and it was very common in the gardens of where we were. Green bee eater. And they have this lovely tail, as you can see, with the extended central feathers. Most of them have throat patches that are quite helpful in identifying, but swooping over and catching all sorts of aerial insects. Another bird just outside the wall of where we were at that particular 
a site close to Vanton Ball, and we came across these birds, sand grouse. Now, sand grouse are a particularly interesting bird. They're desert dwellers, and these were two young birds that I came across, well, cryptically colored, but they do not a normally nest close to a water source. So here's the adult, and when the adults come in, this is not my photograph, but it's a one chosen, but when they come in, they will find a, uh, an area of water and sit down in it, and these feathers of the breast and a lower stomach absorb the water like a sponge. So these birds come in in large flocks to water holes, fill up, and then go back into the middle of the desert where the young are hatched and the young then drink the water from the feathers. So it's a rather interesting adaptation. So here's Rantambo and it's a very, very popular park not far from New Delhi. And here we see, you've heard of Jodhpur, Rajasthan coming out into the Great Western Desert. So it's right on the cusp. Not a large reserve, but it does come through with the Ara Valley and Vindhya Hill ranges. And its location there, is, they brought it with it a mixture of woodlands and highlands, which was very important because in those days, the Maharajas had hunting reserves, which supplied many of the households. And this was the big hunting reserve of this particular region. And uh, we do see throughout a cultural the structures in the middle of parks. But here's how we enter. This was the grand entrance into Rantambore through this gateway, which is now taken over by a banyan tree. And one of the first creatures we met there in the clambering around in the trunk of that tree were these beautiful uh, monkeys, the Hanuman. And Hanuman is one of the Indian gods. Uh, he is revered because he actually leapt into a fire to rescue one of the other gods in the in the uh, in the uh, pan uh, panoply of gods, and as a result, he burned his hands. And this little fellow, as you can see, still has burned hands and a singed face. It's a beautiful monkey, silf silvery silk. We traveled in many different ways. This was the way we traveled in Rantambor in small jeeps, open, and uh, we would travel up. And you can see here we're overlooking a valley that is like this. So it was a fairly dry period of uh, the year. The monsoons come a little later. And so these are the remainder of pools. It's a good time then to look for tigers. And also to find this spectacular little uh, kestrel, the red-capped the red falcon red-necked falcon. It loves these sere areas and you see the nature of woodland and the forest in this section quite open but running up over the hills. Again two more views. Part of a, the game reserves are also found to be large lakes and these are man-made lakes. They're designed to, to again supply water. You'll see a better view of this one in a few seconds. So here we are, typical, very, very dry grass at this time of year. The sal trees are turning yellow, but it's a magnificent time to be in India. And this is the range of two rather a notable Indian species. We have the cheetah deer and we have the peacock. This is the home territory of these two, two animals. And we were just out looking at this point for our first tigers, but this was a, a rather lovely shot of these two together. This was what we were after. And if you've never seen a Bengal tiger in the wild, eh, it is an unsurpassed and soul stirring moment. These majestic cats come and just appear from nowhere and they're there and you sense the power, you sense the regal nature of them. This then is the sheer nature of the, just as a comparison, this is the sheer nature of the terrain. It has a lot of uh, euphorbias and a few of cacti. This is the forest, very open, but uh, with a, a very uh, rich undergrowth of grasses, which feed large herds of deer. 
We also find there one of the more unusual animals, the sloth bear. This is the, uh, the climbing bear that will, find, uh, will climb uh, trees for termite nests and it also digs into them. You see these large claws which are used for digging. It was also the bear that for many years was the dancing bear of India, but that, uh, that particular habit has now been erased. Here we come back then to that lake, the Padam Talao, and part of the uh, reserve is a central valley. At the top was the, was the Maharaja's fortification, and this then was the water source for that. The only way of getting water up there was to have it carried by humans up this escarpment, uh, right to the top. However, it is a remarkable place, especially as we enter winter in India, because it is a place for migrants. Here we see one of the, or uh, we see two of the birds which are uh, Indian. This spectacular bird with this golden, almost a wig that it wears on its uh, head. It's as large as a, a, a chicken and two of the smaller ducks, the spot billed ducks. They're joined by European migrants, the wood sandpiper and spotted wren shank. We also see citrine wagtails and the yellow wagtail. Citrine is a native Indian bird. The yellow wagtail is a European migrant that comes in for the winter. It's also where we find one of the, the a interesting species of deer that India is home to. This is the sambar and it is a water-based deer. It likes to be out here and it wades around, but quite a massive rack, and it is found quite commonly. It's, it's large. It would be a, about a meter, and, a meter and a half to the shoulder, and would weigh close to a 200 kilos in, in the stag. But here's how they like to go about their grazing in these grasslands. And you see how this is just dotted with birds. Here we have the stilts, here we have a red shank, here we have egrets, and I hope you've all noticed it down here, we have this little fellow, the Indian pond hern. So it is a place that draws water boats into a very dry country. It's right on the edge of the Rajasthan desert, and yet it teems with life. Here's a small group of a sambar again, and the Indian boar, the Indian wild pig. The family's there. Quite a bit a, a, of a similarity with African warthogs, but they don't have the tails that stand up and the faces are much more robust. By the way, you notice this little character here. You'll see him in a minute. That's a tree pig. It is also home to this lovely little deer, which only reaches about a, a three quarters of a meter, meter in height, but the spotted deer or cheeto. And this is the prime source of food for uh, tigers in the area. And here we have the, the, they are often accompanied by this bird, the tree pea. And the tree pea is very much like a, a mockingbird here in terms of size, beautifully colored, but you notice what's doing. So these birds go into a sort of semi comatose state as, as the tree peas pick out the uh, lice from the inner part of the year and generally groom them, very much like oxpeckers that we saw in, our, in the trip to Africa at the last meeting. And here's the triangle that you become very accustomed to. The food, the hunter, and the ever wary warning system. So as you're traveling through, you will start to hear the langurs at times starting to <laughs> And then if that happens, the next thing you start to hear are grunts <laughs> from the cheeto. And that tells you this animal is on the move. It is on the hunt. And so this is a very quick association that you link and it was one of the most exciting ones that you can come across. However, there are other things to watch. This is one of, this would be the equivalent of our uh, scarlet tanager in the woods of uh, Rantenbore, 
and a very diminutive but lovely little uh, flycatcher. This is the other way you know there are tigers around. And it, it's, it's uh, rather sad to say that, or to see mass tourism in this form. But uh, it does happen in, in the parks, but they are well managed. And what these folks have come across, somebody has, in one of the guides has spotted, yes, back in the grass, something sitting. Well, it won't take long before they're on the move. And so up she comes, this was a lovely female, and came through the grasses and then made her way across. And we moved our vehicle to a spot, our guide was very good, and he moved into a spot where she knew she would be going. And sure enough, within 10 minutes, out of the grass she came and mounted up onto this lovely this, a ledge of rock. Here she comes, remarkable animals. These parks are filled with people. Most of the work of you, if you're there, a, is carried out by women in India. In the manual labor, well, that is women's work. So these women are building a road and they're putting down a gravel base, in fact, and they're doing it by taking these rocks and smashing them into bits. And then that will be laid on the road. But they work directly alongside tigers. The Indian, these people who are the native people of the, of the region have come to a balance with the tiger and uh, live with it rather than try to compete with it or live in fear of it. This is what men tend to like to do. They like to talk politics and get decisions of a, of a more substantive basis made, apparently. So as you travel, you see them at the, at the coffee shop enjoying a cup of chai. This is unusual, and there are three women here with them. Another sight in terms of women. They will take the, the flock out onto the, onto the grazing land, and look how sear this is. This is the dry time of year, and out go the goats to get it. And there are trees that survive in this case. And here we see one here. These happen to be neem trees. They're used, uh, you can see how these have been pruned up and taken off. These are the uh, twigs that become toothbrushes. But these areas, again, are good for birds and we get some rather specialized ones. This one, the wryneck. It's not a woodpecker, it's not a sparrow, but it's a, an in-between. It's a European migrant and a rather attractive bird to see. This one is an Indian resident, the Desert Wheatio. And just rather interestingly, three years ago, and, uh, uh, one showed up in North Scotland and spent the winter there. I don't know how it got there. <laughs> Here we see another piece of landscape. This is a river valley. And in the dry season, even the rivers are used for agriculture. So you see the sandbars, but how they've been ploughed up. But it is also home to some of the most interesting and uh, enigmatic birds. This little fellow. This is the Indian courser. It would be twice the size of a killdeer, but it lives in very much the same way. It has this interesting little bit of a, a beard and moustache and beautiful display and runs quite actively uh, across this land and, and nests on the sandbars. The other bird that is almost impossible to find if you don't know where you're looking, and even if you do, is the stone curlew, the Indian thick knee. And these birds are nocturnal. Look at the size of the eye. And they feed again in this section, but they will stand for hours in the shade and stock still, and you will bypass them time and again. They're so beautifully camouflaged with this cryptic coloring. Now we're moving to another section outside Rantambor as we move to the east and north, and we run into these heavy hills. And by the way, the hills were important as well for the uh, Maharajas of the area initially because they were filled with gemstones. Uh, Indian, Indian rubies uh, were quite commonly and still are found in this range of hills. But while we were here, we stopped having a, a, a tire changed on our vehicle this one day. And out across the, the stone came one of those 
really Indian birds if, or Indian mammals, if you want to think of it, the mongoose, the Indian gray mongoose. But then much more surprising and just not much bigger than the mongoose came this little fellow. This is the Indian gray fox, the Bengal fox. Beautiful little animal, just about the size of a cat, feeds on termites, look at the big ears, and it is not well looked upon by domestic dogs. This is not my photograph, but it was this little character that took off and the dogs chased it, I'm sure, a good mile down the road before it got out of the way. Here's the farming country that we see. And again, the middle of the drought, cattle from North America are all skin and bones, but these animals look not badly. They are doing quite well. They're adapted to it. And this is where we come into the starling family again, this little beauty. But they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And finally, another one that looks as though it's a, a melanistic bird, but it isn't. This is its normal colouring. So starlings are a family that had its origins in Asia, and so you see a great diversity of species as you travel in India. Now where were we headed? Well, we're heading back towards New Delhi where we started. New Delhi up here, we've traveled south, and now we're coming back up to this area just outside Agra, which is the site of the, of the Taj Mahal, to a rather interesting world heritage site. It is known as Kaladio Bharatpur. You can read there that it is man-made. The wetlands were developed here to provide a hunting resource for that Maharaja in a land that was uh, perennially dry. And he could store the, wind, uh, the waters of the monsoon and ensure the family and the area of food. Now, it does flood annually. And it is quite remarkable. Here are some of the reservoirs, uh, just to take a look at it. These blue areas are the main sections and it is divided into the, the channel that will drain through it and control it. But it is divided into sections for management and it is here that uh, a lot of work is done. You tend to ride in a rickshaw with a guide down the main uh, street. It's a long uh, raised a burn that takes you into the reserve. But as you're traveling, you will come across some rather interesting ones. And again, another bird like the thick knee that's rather hard to see. This is Sykes, a nightjar, very common at Caladio. And again, you know, I think we introduced to the babbler family earlier. And here we have the jungle babbler. The first one was, was the gray babbler, and here we have the jungle. Again, you will see the sandbar out through these wet marshy areas and in the wet season all of this will be flooded completely. When the British Raj took place, they found this site and it became a, a very popular site for British gentry and officers of the army. And it was created at this time and then through here, you notice, in 1938, a shooting party. So now we start to see this coming into. A few state guests till 1965. Well, here was what they did. Here are the hunts laid out, each by date, and the number of birds taken in a day. So here we see Lord Curzon and Lord Kitchener. They took only 540 in that day with 17 guns. But let's take a look at some of these. Viceroy Lord Chelmsford, 4,206 with 60 guns. It was an atrocious slaughter. And over a three day period, the one hunt claimed this number of birds. It's surprising that any survived. Luckily, this was stopped in the mid 1930s. This is what it looks like when it is flooding out. You get these large pans 
wonderful band and the geese from uh, both uh, Mongolia and Europe tend to come in in large numbers. It is a site for the magnificent painted stalk, black neck stalk, excuse me, a most extraordinary bird. And here's how you bird watch again, another way. This is the central uh, uh, burn that takes you into the reserve. And as you look there, you will find other interesting little characters. This is our, uh, their equivalent of the screech owl. It's the spotted owlet. And very much like uh, uh, some of our little birds, very simple little peeping sound. The wetlands have cattle grazing through them. This is what the, uh, the black neck stork likes. And here we see a gathering of ibis and, and a couple of uh, geese here, and then a small turtle. Look at the size of that character. These are about a meter and a half in length and weigh somewhat uh, close to 90 kilos or 200 pounds, quite large turtles. And this is the common woodpecker, uh, or excuse me, the common kingfisher of that area, the white throated. Again, walking along the main burn, the, you keep your eyes open and you find these birds coming through the, the trees at the edges. Common moorhen, a bird that is we have in, in Gray and Bruce County. So it's a widely spread species across the world. The black bittern, very, very unusual to see, quite rare, and definitely a specialty of India. And here, uh, another a brand of animal. These are the large water monitors that will reach up to two and a half meters in length at full size, and they feed quite a bit on birds and ducks and geese. It is a great breeding site. This is the painted stork rookery at uh, Caladio, and uh, wonderful birds as we were there, the young were up. This is an old slide of mine, and uh, I didn't have anything more, so it's very contrasty, but you can see we were there in December, and you can see the size of these birds. The monsoons will soon be coming, so again the synchrony of nesting with food resources that will support uh, hatch hatchlings is very, very important especially in these seer uh, countries. And again, you get this great diversity. The Asian open-billed stork, which is a snail eater. It gets the snails and snaps them between at that, that nutcracker beak. And again, the painted stork. In the previous one, you don't get this remarkable view of color. And the underwings are pink as well. Quite a remarkable one. It also draws large, a, a raptors from the north. The greater spotted eagle is a Russian eagle that comes south and it feeds here. The booted eagle is quite a small eagle actually, very tame, and it uh, hunts at smaller birds. But the booted eagle, or the spotted eagle, is one that will take uh, the geese quite regularly. The goose of interest there is the bar-headed goose. This is the goose that is famous for flying over the Himalayas in migration, and that's above Mount Everest. So they will go to great heights, these bar stripes on their heads, and they gather in fairly significant numbers at Caladio. We also get grey legs there, and these are European and the precursors of most of the domestic geese that we have in the world today. This is the crane of India, although it's really a crane of, of all of the, uh, East Asia and uh, quite common down even into you know, Australia, you find the Sarus crane there. It's a large crane, bigger than our uh, sand hill, but a very common breeding bird in the fields and at Caladio. This, however, was rather a sad story. When I was there in my very first visit, this beautiful crane, and the, these are not my photographs again, but the, this one actually is the last of the Western uh, population of Siberian crane, which nested in the far uh, reaches of the Arctic uh, in Russia and came south down through Turkey and down through the Middle East and across a through the Great Western Desert to winter here. And this, as you can see, 1968, part of a flock 
that of 86. This was my first visit in 2001. This was what I saw. This one, not this particular bird, this one now winters in Syria, but is the very last. But I saw the last of these cranes to migrate into Palladio. And the main reason was the Middle East wars that were going on. These were hunted for food and hunted to extinction over about an eight year period. Really quite tragic. So back on the road, and this is a typical road scene and typical a village or town as we pass through it. And you notice the mix of a forms. I'm not sure which is the right lane and which is the left lane. You can see here there are vehicles moving in both directions. I thought those were coming towards me. That one is also coming towards me. And oh, yes, we have this often coming towards you as well down the road. So it's an interesting country to drive in. As a guide, I would often say, who would like to take the front seat of the bus? And the first day, the, everybody, yes, yes, good. They, after the first run, they said, no, no, we're quite happy to sit back. <laughs> it's quite a, quite a process. Again, another side of India and its cities, the main food supply, or not food supply, excuse me, the main fire source and heat source is also a food supply. It's the cow, which supplies the milk that uh, Hindus revere, and it also supplies cow pads. And what these women are doing is taking it and gathering it and by hand shaping these uh, pancakes of dung. And then these are sold off to a, a stoke the braziers that are fired up each evening. And a lot of this air condition that you, are, you see here, this massive pollution is as a result of burning this dung. It is still one of the main sources of pollution in India's air. But look at plastic. This is the other great a thing that is a, a blight everywhere you travel now. The bird that associates itself with this is rather an interesting one and a very pretty bird. This is the Egyptian vulture. This is the one famed as a tool user. It will use a stone to come and break open eggs, but it also feeds heavily on waste materials that it finds in these inner city sections. That was the town of Agra and sitting on the show on the shores of the river eh, in Agra is this beautiful building. I think it is the world's most perfect building of all and built by Shah Jahan for his favorite wife, Muntaz. And he built it for her over a number of years and didn't live to see himself able to visit the, this mausoleum. His brother kicked him out of, a, out of a power and imprisoned him in the Red Fort where he could look at this magnificent creation from a distance. But if you look, the, I mentioned the, the days or the raised platform here. I mentioned the main building. The two uh, coffins are placed directly under the center. He was buried beside her when he died in the middle of this, in the middle of the mausoleum. But you notice here, all of this rather interesting work. This is done with incised stone. So the stone is carved and fitted in, and then is with a, a special wax made from beeswax and a forms of glue that comes in. But the number of rich, semi-precious stones are incredible. And you can identify the flowers that you can see. Here we have iris. Here we have Lily, and the decoration is spectacular. This is your first view of it. It is an overwhelmingly beautiful building. Now, getting in and out of the cities and moving around, you do have the option of traveling by car, and sometimes that's just not an option. So we did travel on a couple of occasions by train, uh, and this is what you see. As you get onto the train, 
It comes in, and you can see the numbers. It is the world's busiest railway, and over every, each day, there are over one and a half million people travel by rail in India. Now, the services aboard are rather basic. Here is your washroom. That is an open hall through to the train tracks. This is how you flush, get some water and pour it down. Otherwise, you place your feet strategically and uh, hope for the best. Here is the overnight accommodation. Jan and I <laughs> have one. I was up on top and she was down below and you pull the screens. Uh, Normally we, do, we didn't travel very far, but we did have one overnight in the trains and we kept folks very close together at that time. We're now headed to Bandgar and you can see it's quite a distance from Agra. Glorious park, again, set into valleys and hills. Now we're into the Vindhya, a mountain range and the central Indian highlands. A large reserve, it was it's again established partly from a hunting reserve and it has this mixture, as you can see, of lowland and highland with particular forests of cell. Here are, is the mix, these beautiful uh, grasslands with the, with the seed heads that shine in the sun, deciduous forests. Here's the cell forest to go into it. And I was always amazed at how little regeneration there was. But apparently this is quite normal and uh, it has been there this way for thousands of years, or I shouldn't say thousands, but likely hundreds of years. Where the saplings come from, I don't know. These are the birds of the cell forest, the little Indian white eye or oriental white eye, and down here, the Indian robin. You also get two of the parrots. And uh, these, this one is quite a large one. The Alexandrine parrot would be maybe about twice the size of a blue jay. This bird, the most colorful of them all, the size of a blue jay. And again, they, they move through these forests eating them fruit and uh, uh, newly emerging seed heads of grass. You can see that's what the bird is eating here. It's picked this up and br brought it up into the, into the bamboo. It's here that we find a, one of the antelope of India. This is the largest one. This is Nilgai or blue bull. This is the female. They both have this sort of dewlap, quite different. This is as large as the horns ever get on the, on the a blue bull, but they tend to like this mixed forest and open plain. They would be the size of a small a, of a small horse, a, one used by teenagers, for instance, for riding lessons, about that size. They're quite, quite sizable, but it's a, in terms of overall size. Here we see we're now moving up into the hills, and this is where we get the great Malabar hornbills. And these do sound like a baby in distress. <coughs> <laughs> and they needing to be fed or changed or something, but they're quite colorful and large birds with this magnificent cask. And this is what they eat. They eat these fruits of, of the forest. Alongside them, you get the gray hornbill. And hornbills, again, Africa and through Asia, they tend to be endemic species in that area. You don't find a, an equivalent bird in South America, and we certainly don't have them into the north. Misty mornings. You would think India is hot at all times. Yeah, I should have mentioned this at Rantambore, but when we started out in Rantambore, we would start in the mornings and it would be maybe five degrees, and by lunchtime it'd be 35 degrees. Very uh, dramatic changes of temperature, and you would have these misty mornings and that would burn off very quickly to a scaldingly hot day. Here are the birds. Uh, the Orioles. You all, I'm sure, have recognized an Oriole when you saw it there. Quite a large Oriole. This would be the size of a blue jay here. Along with it, this spectacular little uh, flycatcher. Not my, not my uh, photograph, but a uh, black naped and spectacular. We found several nests of these as we travel. And again, 
raptors. Raptors uh, are a major part of the Indian scene, and there are many of them, and they're not birds that you have to look for a great deal, they're there. So as we drive in the morning, you see them silhouetted, sitting up, looking down. This is the same bird, uh, or the same species, and this is the crested serpent eagle. Quite a lovely bird with a speckled uh, section. It is a snake eater, so it sits and just waits and uh, comes down onto snakes and gets them. A very close relative in this type is this one. And this bird sat very, very, it was a, a really extra uh, cooperative <laughs> photographic subject. This is the changeable hawk eagle, quite large, bigger than our red tail hawk for comparison of size. And here it is, it's quite an imperious looking bird. And that's a jungle babbler that it went off and got and dropped back and sat and ate. And here we see the large Ranger Hills at the top. There is another small fortification at the top, but these are incredible cliffs eh, for vultures, eh, nesting sites, and I'll look at that in a moment. But here again, these large plains, superb areas for, for wildlife. And it's where the wild boar likes to be. This is a male, you notice those lovely whiskers. And that's his eye just there. And where you have those, you have these. And this was one of the tigers we had in that section. Tigers were not short in supply. You, you would see one or two normally each day. And we're very, very fortunate to have that, that uh, opportunity. I must say the tigers have also been very fortunate in the changing climate and a culture in India that now sees them as being a very, very important part of the Indian landscape. And the numbers have now tripled since I was there. So tigers have done well through the tiger reserves and a system of compensation because they will take domestic animals close to the reserve edges. And uh, India is very active in promoting an equal restitution. So if you lose a cow, you're paid for that cow, but let the tiger live. Here are some of the animals that are also in those lovely pampas-like areas. One of the most uh, beautiful animals is this one, the black buck. Not common in the east, and actually it has now disappeared from this uh, particular reserve because of management to help uh, bring back the tiger. They were bringing a change of the habitat structure, and so the black buck disappeared. It really does need open space. The munchak, this is the little tusked deer. It has these funny little prong horns, but then it has tusks that it, uh, 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 define it. It looks almost pig-like in its structure. It's quite a small animal. And then the one that you would say is the most typical of antelope, is the Indian gazelle, Chinkaro. These grasslands, again, home to many. Common stone chat is a resident. The red avidavit is a sought after bird tick. And then a, a very widespread and interesting little family, the Prinias, which are, I would put them in the almost a class of being a wren, eh, the way they are, but they have this lovely long tail, and quite, quite eh, distinctive. And they're grassland birds that we would find. And here again, this mix of grand, grasslands, and here is what was being managed for. The Cheeto, these are the spotted deer, you notice a good numbers. And then as you look up, it's interesting because the treetops are an equally important spot. Again, we see the rhesus monkey up there. And here we see a young family. But we also in the morning find these birds coming in with the early morning sun. This is an absolutely exquisite dove. Yellow-footed green pigeon. And they feed on this particular plant, which is the peepal. You can see from its leaves, it's a bit like, let me just go back. I think I can do that. Yes, you'll notice these are very aspen-like leaves. It is a member of the aspen family. It is a populous and shiny, but they have quite strong a seed 
production, and these birds then come and feed on them from the catkins as they're developing. Then we also travelled by elephant to see tiger. So we saw a tiger in many cases. And this is a young animal, a, a young female. And again, with the elephants, they are very, very calm. This animal is likely about five meters from us and sitting atop the howdah. After a morning out, it, as I say, is cold and you end up with the ranger's village and they make you a hot carb cardamom tea. And regardless of where that cup has been or how it was washed, I did not see anybody who refused it. Doesn't that look good? <laughs> then we visited villages and uh, many of these, as I say, they are villages uh, and village people. And they're rich uh, societies, very, very, we many people here would say primitive lifestyles, the livestock still used in the courtyard in the middle of the house. But they're rich with, the, with birds and they're rich with animals. And this is again a typical Asian a subgroup, the bull bulls, and this fellow, the large bill crow. So we see the white eared bull bull and the large bill crow, two very quintessential birds in India and always found around these communities. It's also a spot because of the trees that are available for Indian flying fox. Now this is not a small bat, it's a big bat. If you take a moment and just spread your arms, bend them at the elbow, and that's the wingspan. They're a fairly sizable bat. The wingspan is almost a meter, and they do hang up and slide down in this form. And these birds are showing a little distress because they're not because of people, but they're trying to keep cool. This is one of the problems for bats in India at the moment is the extreme heat now, and you see them trying to cool themselves. What happened there? <laughs> Let me just go back. I talked it too quickly. Here are the cliffs. And I just want you to see that on these cliffs, you notice the amount of whitewash. This was a major nesting colony for years with about 500 pairs of vulture, a, both, a, both a white backed and long billed nesting on these forms. And then within a matter of three years, this happened. Where's the whitewash? You see one tiny spot, 2001. It was an absolutely cataclysmic collapse of vultures in India. Now, here's a photograph to give you an idea of what vultures were about. This is an older photograph, but these are mainly, a, in this case, long-billed vultures feeding on scrap piles. Look at them along here. Look at them here. This was the number of birds that you were constantly seeing. Well, I shouldn't say constantly seeing this jam packed, but it was a very, very common bird in India when I first visited. You in the cities, you were never out of sight of them. These were major garbage solution, recyclers and the devourers of garbage and suddenly they were gone. This is what replaced them. These are not vultures. These now are red kites. This was where the vultures would have been. And you see again, these are untouchable, the untouchable class scrabbling for a living. Not easy. This is the particular uh, problem, diclofenic. This is a muscle reaction, a uh, muscle re relaxant, and it was used widely in India for uh, injecting into cattle, but particularly troublesome was that it was provided cattle, or the cattle were injected just before slaughter. Now, I don't know what the association with muscle relaxant and slaughter was, but as the animals went through the slaughterhouse, the offal was pitched outside and it was laced with this drug. 
And this drug led immediate a, a liver failure and the death of birds within two days. And it was massive. And so these birds would come in and feed. This is a long-billed vulture. And they would pick up, and the old theory that I think most of us are now aware of, that if you pick up the food, any pesticide within it is taken in. And if you keep going to animals, you multiply the effect. So these vultures got quite a massive dose, either from natural dead cattle or these. And this is what happened. This was a shot and may have been one of the last of its kind if there had not been some major restorative action taken. Um, it's very slow, but they captured many uh, vultures before they died. And through a captive rearing program, they have now started to bring back the white white uh, bat vulture. It used to number approximately 10 million birds in India, and at its lowest, at its nadir, it was down to 8,000 birds. It is now somewhere uh, closer to 800,000 birds. So they are coming back, but it's a very, very slow and uh, labor-intensive work to bring vultures back. Not only was it a uh, garbage disposal, but for the Parsi people who do not wish to uh, defile the earth with a dead body, the gardens of the dead in Mumbai are places where they have the plinths and the bodies are laid on top of the plinth, open to the elements, and vultures were the main means of uh, slowly transforming the body back to nature. They devoured the bodies and the collapse has turned that religious belief on its head. So it has had profound effects in India. And yes, the cattle are still there and are still doing the, the farming tasks. But here again, rural life, look at the color, look at the interaction. These markets are absolutely astounding. And food is certainly one of the major, but also homeware and handcrafts. Now we're coming to the last of our parks, the Kana. And if any of you have ever read The Jungle Story, this is where it was written by Roger Kipling. It's quite a, an interesting park. It's again close to a mountain range, Satpura Range, which is, it forms one of the eastern bastions to the central Indian highlands. Here we see again sow and uh, the meadows that we have. So this particular bird is a rather interesting one. I don't think I put in the name, but that, no, I didn't. Fishing owl. This is a, one of the fishing owls, and we were very lucky to find it on one of our occasions, the only one bird. But here we have the park. It's a mixture of these beautiful streamlands and uh, woodlands surrounding them. Here it is in the morning light. And it's at that time that the uh, beaters have been out with the elephants looking for tigers for people such as us to travel out and see, and they come back through the tall uh, uh, grasses and pick us up and then we head out. It's, this is dawn. Again, the mists are down. It's a, it's a magical place. You see the deer below. The deer here are different. They may look much the same, but these are the largest deer in India. This is the Barasinga. It has very special a, a hooves, which are almost like a snowshoes in a way. They're very plate-like, and they allow these deer to move through very muddy areas. And again, they're another water deer. They spend most of the time in these watery meadows, and again, excellent a, a food for tiger. Here's the parkland, and you may not think it has anything, but if you look over here, you'll see the deer, several deer here. You never look far, but that you see deer. And of course, this habitat, this mix of habitat is ideal again for you know who. Tiger on the prowl. This is the way to see them. 
And elephants are a most interesting animal when you ride on them. They are so gentle. They have this rhythm that you just fall into. But going uphill or downhill, the most gentle and responsive of animals. And all the time, every time there's a bit of food and within reach, the trunk goes out, grabs it, and then it comes back and on they go. <laughs> This is what he, you might look for in alternatives. Indian leopard, Jan and I were very fortunate to see one in India, a much rarer than the tiger, but a lovely cat, much smaller. And then the typical Indian wild cat, it's called jungle cat. Quite small, but a, a likely about twice the size of most a common house cats here. And again, the birds. Now, one of the things that almost amazed me in India was the number of birds in the country, and especially birds such as shrikes. Here we see two shrikes at the top, and a cuckoo-like bird that is much a very heavy insect feeder, the greater cuckoo. And with these, they are not uncommon at all, not in the way that our shrikes here are endangered by agricultural practices. And this is one of the concerns that now is being voiced in India. This is one of the concerns that they have not had agribusiness with the huge chemical inputs. And as a result, the land is still fairly pure and unsullied. And the farming grounds are healthy. They've been used for many, many years, but using organic uh, methods. So these birds survive. And it's a real joy to go out and every day see seven or six, six or seven of these shrikes of different types. And uh, during the time I was in India, eight species of shrike that I observed. And so it was quite interesting. So here we are just thinking of getting going. And here was where we stayed a tiger heaven <laughs> and in those gardens we had a, the swallows nesting up under the eaves and then two beautiful birds leaf birds are a particular family again a small insectivore but it, 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 it spends a lot of time like a nuthatch probing into bark you can see that beak this one looks like our bluebird tickles blue flycatcher finally up here one of the european swallows a, that is quite common, the red rumped swallow. Here we saw the hoopo again, incredible bird, <laughs> and it was down feeding on the ground. Now, this is what one of the forests that we hadn't seen up until then. This is basically bamboo forest mixed in with sal, and these giant bamboos that you can see that reach up a 10 meters in height, were found everywhere. You see it here, this one has matured and now is dying off, but again, the cell throughout. And quite often as you go into this, there's a rather strange sound, a sort of a And why? Well, this was the home of the red jungle fowl. This is the famous wild bird. Looks like a banty rooster. And it was great to go through these forests and hear this. This was one of the common sounds of these little groups. And you would see them running across the road. There'd be a cockerel and maybe three or four females with them. And they'd race across and they'd be chasing each other around. Quite a lush forest compared to many of the forests that we saw in other places. And it's the home to the largest of the bovines in the world. This is gore. And this, this fellow, it would be as big as a, as a Holstein bull, but it is a wild animal, not a domesticated animal. The one at the bottom is a young a calf, likely about two years of age, and they are a forest animal. And you will be driving through the forest, you see the thickness of the vegetation here, and suddenly they'll just step out into the, into the open spot by the road. Again, this lush forest and water. This was a real change that we found. This is a green park inside out. And here was where we came across one of the most extravagant of the birds. This is Paradise Flycatcher. 
spectacular. And one of my favourites, this fellow, the greater racket-tailed Drongo. Insectivorous birds. And on, onto the mountains. We, uh, we've travelled up onto the Vineyard uh, Hills and uh, this is the forest that you find along that section, beautiful, rich, deciduous forest. And some of these unusual birds. Uh, this one, the largest of the bee eaters, it's quite a, an attractive bird, inner forest, and you notice the blue throat here, which is why it gets the name blue uh, bearded. This little fellow, if you've been to East Africa, you'll know it. The common Iora is an Asiatic a, a family, the Ioras, like Orioles, and down here is the one I got out of sink, the brown-headed Barbie. And this was where we did see vultures from a different perspective. This is a top looking down, you can see the forests below. And here we have these lovely creatures. Well, anybody who's watched vultures for any length of time, I think has to say they're lovely. When you see the mastery of the air, when you see the perfection of the, the movement of these, these primaries, as they just use them as fingers to filter through the air and set the direction so perfectly. It's also where we get the, the eagles again coming in. This one, the tawny eagle from uh, Europe. Cheeto come out into these areas and look at the grasslands. It's a prairie in and of itself. And when you get that, this is where the famous Indian wild dog or dole is found. And look at these teeth. These, these hunt like the African wild dog, and if you notice, the African wild dog has this nice fluffy tail, so do these. And they run in packs, and they basically run down their prey. They run them to exhaustion and then just uh, bring them to ground. Not a pleasant way, but a very efficient way for a predator in tough conditions. Being a predator is not an easy life. And, of course, we keep coming across these magnificent creatures. Here again, rivers. And where we get rivers, we get some of the small water birds. This is little greed. Animals move to them. And suddenly the jungle becomes a place that you lose a sense of time as this movement through Eden goes on around you. You've time to sit and watch these beautiful monkeys, Lankers, nursing babies, grooming them. The young guys beginning to look out and see what life is all about. And wouldn't you know it, there are always people ready to watch you and photograph. So this is what we did in India. We, I was lucky to do it several times with marvelous groups of people. And as we went, we did see wonderful things and memories to tuck away. And so this then brings our end to our trip through the parks. So the sign says it for us, thanks for your visit as we leave Kana National Park. And with that, it was back onto the roads and across to Mumbai on the coast and back into metropolis and modern day uh, India. The images came back of things within those cities, but what we'll always remember are what India has worked hard to preserve. Tigers and peacocks. These, with their temples, make a unique blend of a place to travel. Thank you. So I will leave that now. I'll go out of the share. And that should bring me back to Brian. There we are, Pam. And I must say, uh, one of the things I discovered with the, in putting these together for this, I offered to do this as a, a fill-in at one point, but moving from one, an old computer to the new, 
you noticed that was, there was a slight focus problem. So I apologize for a, a images in some cases that were out of focus a little bit. So my apologies for that. Brian, were you going to look in at the um, Q&A for Peter? Pam, do, are you muted still? Oh. Uh, I could hear Pam. Yeah. Yeah, I could hear Pam. Uh, so Peter, do you do have, well, first that was fabulous. I didn't see anything wrong with the pictures. Uh, so I don't, <laughs> they were beautiful, uh, just some beautiful sites that uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, we do have a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, if anyone wants to type any in, feel free. Um, if you can access that, Peter, I will let you go ahead and do that. Otherwise I can read them out for you if you prefer. I'm not hearing you, Brian. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Pam, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> okay, yep. uh, but Peter can't hear us. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'm not sure if, you're, if his volume is down. <laughs> yeah, I can hear Peter fine. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, doo -doo -doo. It's probably not going to turn out. I'm going to try and type in a message to Peter, uh, and we'll see if he can read this all. Fabulous, uh, Peter. Uh huh. It's up. Oh. Uh. Our audience is saying they hear all of us. Okay. <laughs> Q&A. All right, I'm going to type in chat if Peter, Peter uh, hopefully can see the Q&A. So <laughs> okay. this is a new tech problem we found. So yeah. it's a good night. <laughs> no, I don't know how I answer it. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes. You're hearing me. Okay. Yep. Does grazing goats on land that is already a bear mean that India has dust storms like we see from China? Dust storms do come into India and certainly goats are a problem everywhere they go. They graze very, very heavily. So normally those are kept in herds that are rotated as you saw the three women with that one one picture of a small goat herd, or boys or girls go out there, they, they tend the goats, and it's a constant movement. Uh, these are now becoming problematic because the people who, who did this initially were nomadic. So they moved around and did find a, a rotating food supply, but now they're tending to live in villages, and you will get these areas surrounding that may be devoid of vegetation. Mm. Second one from David Morris. David, you're busy. <laughs> Use of muscle relaxant probably resulted in more tender meat. Yes, I wondered about what we were ingesting. Think of what you're ingesting. <laughs> yeah. It's time to go. Anyway, yes, it was a muscle relaxant, but it, it, it led to renal failure, uh, automa uh, just very rapid uh, and right across. They would last maybe a day after they were, were seen to be affected. From Elizabeth, how would you grade the quality of education and healthcare avail available in the rural villages? You saw the conditions that I was looking at. India is very dusty. It's a very busy place. It's dry and especially when we were there, it's at the end of the, the dry season waiting for the monsoons. But every morning, Regardless, you saw these impeccably dressed children eh, heading out, looking like English eh, private school children with jackets and blazers, the eh, girls with their hair pulled back into a pigtail and in uniforms, India places a very high eh, value on education. But sadly, it's not universal. The caste system, which was legislated out of being, shows the aspect that without a, 
acceptance, legislation doesn't mean much. And so the caste system is still very operational in India. And so the lower castes are people who do not get education, which is a great pity. And, uh, but generally, uh, even the villages uh, have their schools and they are attended and they have a system of uh, exams that are written for high school and these are extended to the villages as well. Health, health, I don't know, but we see that we see the problems in India today. Just look at it when you have the billions of people there and you get a pandemic. You can see we think we're in trouble here, but it's, it's cataclysmic. The people are dying before they get to hospital and dying in the streets. So I'm not sure. If you want high class surgery, I know there is a complete medical tourism, so I'll get that off the side, medical tourism industry, and some of the finest doctors in the world hey, practice in a, a Delhi, and you can go to these clinics and get very, very fine medical treatment. But again, it is private medicine at that, at that stage. The public system does not provide the same degree of care. Okay, I think that, oh, no, we're down here. What country would you like to visit that you haven't seen yet and why? <laughs> Barbara, I think you know the answer to that one. Uh, you cannot compare countries. You go, I go with an open mind and I've never been disappointed, but I can't compare tigers in India with jaguars in Brazil with Adelie penguins in Antarctica, with polar bears in Canada. Each has its uniqueness and every day I just go out. We have our own special place here. The world is here for all of us and it has remarkable diversity. So the joy of traveling is in one's mind. I don't know if that helps or not. What unique problems uh, uh, relate to the tourism industry in India? Elizabeth McKinley. It's the same with tourism everywhere, I think, at the moment. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, I felt that every time I guided, I was on a, a very strange balance. I wanted people to see, I wanted people to learn, but in taking them, was I tilting a balance towards an economic support at the, at the uh, loss of habitat, uh, to damage to what we were going to see? Because you saw in that one picture where there were something like 12 Jeeps, each of them with five, eight, depending on the Jeep size, crowding around that animal and what that does, is that, is that really the experience of a tiger? And we tend now with the, the nature of society, we tend to have a bucket list. So people tend to go and say, oh, I've seen that, click. And they'll take a picture to record it, and then it's there. I'm not sure that we have really understood what it is to see a tiger. A tiger is an ecosystem. A tiger is an evolution. A tiger needs to be seen over a period of time to start to understand that this is a superb creature that again, I come back to the same idea that has shared the same evolution as you and I. And that is a pinnacle of, of evolution and a pinnacle of the creation as is a spider. So tourism, I think, tends to run a bit roughshod over that. And this is one of the concerns, that, and especially now where we're pushing to get out and where do we go? Well, we go into a uh, cruise ships uh, and this, you know, then we come up to a tiny Caribbean island and we disperse a 2,000 people ashore and then we leave. And it's the same in India. It, uh, we don't leave much behind to 
a benefit in terms of a of help to the people who have hosted us and in terms of revering the habitats we've been through. I'm sorry you got me on my on my a uh, one of the things that I've come to as I get more and more white hair, which by the way is quite long now. I didn't want it that way on here. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, thank you for that. David, what is India going to do for water in the future now that the glaciers are melting and the groundwater reserves are being exhausted? What is Alberta going to do? It's the same question. It's what we're doing around the world. Uh, absolutely. We're in a crisis as a, as a species. We have moved towards a, a very delicate time. As we know, we're finding it with global climate change. But also, if we think of that, it's delicate in that we still think we have resources to exploit. Now we have a pandemic. It is showing us that nature will have a way. And what we must recognize is that we have lived and squandered and plundered the incredible gift that is this planet. And we are biological and if we exhaust the resources which have supported us, we're going to have problems. India is in dire shape right now, you're right, David, but so is the Peace River out west and several other of the rivers coming from the Rockies flooding, they are flowing east into the, into the prairies. So, okay. I think that's it and you've heard enough of my rambling. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Well, Peter, I have enjoyed this immensely. <laughs> I love hearing, oh, <laughs> sorry, you should be able to. <laughs> um, anyway, I've loved having you. It's been beautiful. Um, I was surprised that there was as many birds in India as there were in Africa that were so similar. And um, I really appreciate your view on things. And if anyone else is interested in some of the people things in India, I have a book here that I was given called Shantaram. It's a very big read, very large read, but it's a very, very good one. So if anyone is interested in that. So um, I'm not sure if you can hear me or not, Peter, but I think uh, we've <laughs> had a good time. It's 25 to 9, so I think we're ready to go. Thank you so, so much. And we look forward to hearing from you at any time. Okay. Thank you, Pam. I'm reading your comments. I appreciate them very much. Brian is doing quite well at the oh. typing. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Good night, everyone. And thank you again, Peter. <laughs>